Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Must we need thy tender care? In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy folks prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus. Please be seated. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. You must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing anyone does not remain in me he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers such branches are picked up thrown to the fire and burned if you remain in me and my words remain in you ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you this is to my father's glory that you be, that you bear much fruit showing yourself to be my disciples as the father has loved me so i have loved you and remain in my love if you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and, re and remained in his love. I have told you this, that, you may jo that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. May God bless the reading of his word. Thank you, Leah. Well, almost 11 months ago, Hurricane Dorian devastated the Bahama Islands. I kind of got up this morning to see how Isaias, I practiced that all morning again, it's just hard, uh, the hurricane 
that is, was in the area. It had been downgraded uh, to a tropical storm, but I read that shelters have been set up for people that are still in temporary housing because they haven't recovered yet from Hurricane Dorian. Remember that. It leaves our news, but people are still putting their lives back together back there. We're so thankful for the Isaacs family and, and just what they mean to us and ask, you know, just to just remember to pray for those that they know, but all the people that are in the Bahamas. But as I was planning that, you know, I was up this morning early like I usually do, just kind of tweaking a few things, and, and then all of a sudden my phone blows up five, four times, four times, don't over-exaggerate, for a tornado warning. Well, we got precious people living upstairs, and I'm trying to figure out, do I wake them and get them downstairs? Uh, we don't have a basement, so I don't even have that option. Uh, you know, one time we brought our girls over here in the basement here because we, we just live on a slab. Well, I, I woke my wife up, and, and she, uh, she said, yeah, let's get mom down here. Dad can come down quickly. Mom has the lift, so it, it can't come down that fast. But uh, we just kind of watched everything and, and took our time to make sure of what was going on. But isn't there enough to worry about? <laughs> isn't there enough to worry about? I uh, attended a webinar this week from uh, Karen University about general anxiety disorder. Those are big words that we put together just to say people worry. But if you have general anxiety disorder, or GAD as they call it, um, you might be worrying and there's nothing really to worry about. It's just something that's settled into your being. And they have all kinds of uh, ways to diagnose it. There's so many things. If you check off enough of these lists, you're, you're you know, you, you have GAD. And, and so as I was listening to that, one of the things they said was, it all comes down to our coping skills. You'll hear me talk a lot about coping skills, mainly to warn against the sinful ones. Sinful coping skills do not help you at all. But there are some non-sinful ones that um, you just, you'll hear people say, well, at least I have my health, or at least I have a good job, or at least I have my family and friends. And when we were talking about that, COVID-19 attacked all of those things. COVID impacted our fear for our health. And, and it bothers me when I hear about somebody who died with COVID, you know, because of COVID-19. They also had cancer. They all has had, had something else. But that's the thing. Those people that are already sick really have to be careful with this disease. But it doesn't mean everybody gets it, you know. So, so the health and then the economy. You know, I remember I didn't notice anything about the health. The first thing that got my attention was I saw the stock market crash. It's not like I'm heavily invested, but it's, it's my only hope for retirement. So I'm watching it, all right? So I saw that crash, and that got my attention. And it bounced back, but who knows? Who knows what's next? And then the fact that we have not been able to get together the way we want to with our family and friends. Um, I think people are loosening up a little bit and doing different things. And everybody has a different level of tolerance for what they're willing to do at this time. But all of that has been under attack. But not only that, our church ministries have been impacted by COVID-19. As, as Dio said, we're starting to open a few things up, but we have a lot of work to do to figure out what's going on. And I was thinking how the ladies' Bible studies shut down, the evening one, which was just getting started. The Tuesday one this had been going on, but they shut down. Joy Club shut down. Victory Voices was planning to sing the national anthem at an uh, uh, Iron Pigs game. And Awana was, had already bought the tickets for an Iron Pigs game to give out to the clubbers for uh, achievements that they had done. So we had all these things kind of, in, if you want to, you can go on the church website and look at the calendar. We didn't take things off, we just wrote cancel. You kind of get a flow for how many things were affected by that. Just, we, didn't, we just wanted to show what our plans were based and what had to be canceled. Um, the Schifanos uh, had just been sending me some stuff and discussing about how to make Sunday school more effective. Well, it's shut down now. And that's one of the harder ones. To have a VBS this week when it's a group of people kind of for two hours moving around, but Sunday school for an hour in a room, we have to really think about how we want to do that. And so, but, you know, people were thinking about things. Um, our, um, our youth group had been going through Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. We all need peace. <laughs> and, and teens need to be taught early how to find peace with their finances. But that had to shut down. And I need to announce, we haven't announced it yet, Phil has asked to step aside from his work with the youth group. 
and we need to recruit for that. Phil is also seeking to not sing as much so that he can help with our uh, sound room and technology. And if one thing we've learned through the whole COVID-19 response, we need a lot of technical people to help. We've recruited some, and we're so thankful for Ken and Jeff and those that have made this work. But if you are at all interested in helping with that, we can, I should say, somebody can train you. I don't, shouldn't say we, I can't. But somebody can train you and help you with that. And if you're at all interested in just encouraging teens, if we do nothing else but plan a trip to a corn maze this fall, you know, we, there are things that we could do even if we don't have the full uh, ministry. And on the 16th of this month, is that the right date? Uh, anyway, Sunday, uh, I think the third Sunday of this month, uh, Peter, uh, Katie, is coming back. He has uh, had great um, experience in building a youth ministry from scratch. And, and so we have to really evaluate, and he's going to share with us some of the principles that he has learned, and not just in a message, but we'll have a couple of meetings in the evening, and, and just for those that are interested in helping, be in prayer about those things. Because where I'm going today is basically studying the book of Ephesians, because Ephesians is the church book. Corinthians is the troubled church book. <laughs> a lot of things that had to be corrected in the church. Ephesians was written just to encourage the, the people at Ephesus and how they were doing church. When I first started to preach, after preaching a series on peacemaking, because I wanted to make sure we had unity, first of all, uh, the next thing I preached was First Timothy, who was one of the pastors at Ephesus for a while. And I, I, I took it, that was more about teaching him how to lead a church. Well, Ephesus is about how to be a church. So as I was burdened for that, I began to think, okay, before I jump into be Ephesus, and if you ever want an overview of a book, just find the Bible Project online, a YouTube, just search in YouTube Bible Project and put the name of a book, and they draw this beautiful picture like that, and they explain everything as they're drawing it. You look at that, it's like overwhelming, but as they go through it, it's awesome. It's really awesome. So, so, but I'm, I'm not going to go into Ephesians probably until September because there's so much in Paul's life as he was doing his ministry that led to him. Now, he was in Ephesus longer than any other place. A year and a half at Corinth, and he went back to visit Corinth, but he was over two years in Ephesus. In all of his travels, that's where he stayed the longest. So there's things that, there are things that we have to, to learn from him. And as I was planning on jumping into Acts 18, which is where he first is introduced to Ephesus, I really need to back up to Acts 9 and, and see just who Paul is. He's the author of this book. We need to remind ourselves what made Paul tick. And hopefully that'll get us started as we then look about all the things that led to his ministry in Ephesus, led him while he was in prison then in Rome to write them this letter. So I, I think that gives you an idea of the background. We're going to be talking about Paul's salvation and his initial commitment to the Lord today. And the daily bread from yesterday was from the passage that Leah re read. And it just reminded me the very thing I was thinking. We have to be able to adapt to our world. And Paul was completely adaptable. He had to be. He had to be. And, and uh, but firm on the things that he had needed to be firm on, but he was adaptable with what he was doing in ministry. And, but as we adapt, we need to remem remember we have to abide. We have to abide in the vine or we will bear no fruit. So my proposition this morning is from John 15. We must abide in Christ to bear fruit. We must abide in Christ to bear fruit. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. There's so many things that we can draw out with different themes. I pray that this morning we focus on who Apostle, the Apostle Paul is and how we can know of his, um, what made him successful, what made him fruitful in his ministry. In his ministry. I pray that you would help us. I, I ask that you would just bless us as we look into your word. Have mercy on me, a sinner, that nothing I am or say, my worries, my fears, um, that anything would get in the way of this message today. Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. My wife and I, when we read the Daily Bread, said, why do we fail to abide? What causes us to fail? And we both came up, we forget. We actually have the thought that we can tackle our world on our own. 
So we need to constantly remember a couple of things, and that's where we're going to go. But before that daily bread, my wife had been telling, us, telling me about Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and I would like to read that together. Let's read that together. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Uh, one version says he will direct your paths. This idea, if we need to be guided on how to open up, we need to obey this verse, which is the same thing as saying abide. Acknowledge him in all of our ways. Don't lean on our own brilliance. Lean on him. Trust in him and acknowledge him in everything we do. And he will make straight our paths. He will lead the way. So that's the focus that I want to see, but I want to start with two things we need to remember. First of all, we need to remember our need for grace. We need to remember our need for grace. We are never at a time when we don't need grace. Acts 9, I'm not going to read the whole passage. I'm just going to read selected verses from it. Starting at verse 3, we're talking about Paul here. It says, now as Paul went on his way, remember he's heading to Damascus to kill Christians. That's his goal. He approached Damascus. And suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. And we know he arose and was blind. And they took him into the city. This is Paul's salvation experience. (laughs) If you jump down to verses 17 through 18, So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on Paul, he said, Brother Saul, the the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. I'll say Saul, Paul, back interchangeably early on. He was referred to as Saul much as it goes on. He's called Paul. But Ananias was sent there. He was a little afraid to. You'll see in a few verses in a moment. But he was afraid to go, but he went. Now, this is the testimony of all testimonies. I was walking along a road, fighting against God with every part of my being, and a light blinded me to get my attention. Okay, How many of you have that testimony? Okay. Now, I guarantee you, in your testimony... You had a recognition of your sin. You had that recognition, and you had an opportunity to respond to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Savior of the world. He died for your sins, and he rose again. Don't worry about having that flashy testimony. I believe I just kind of, from age five, I just knew it, and I just knew it. I just knew it, and I believed it. There were times when I finally became assured because I didn't have that moment of, I prayed this prayer, I signed my Bible. I just knew that I believed in Jesus. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so, so just know that we need grace for salvation. That's the foundation of it all. Now, going on to, uh, go back to verse 15. This is uh, Ananias kind of protesting. I don't want to go. He's killing Christians. I don't want to go. He said, but, for, but the Lord said to him, Go. For he, Paul, is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the children of Israel. We're not only giving grace for salvation, we need grace for service. If you want to do things, and a lot of people said, I want to do more during COVID-19 to help people. Well, you need God's grace. You need him. You need to acknowledge him and let him direct your paths. Do the little things that he gives you to do. And it might just be talk to a neighbor for a little bit. Just wave at them. Be, be friendly towards them. I went into a place I shouldn't have gone in for my diet sake, but I went in there anyway. And I got to talking to him about his business. And we just joked. And at one point I mentioned I was a pastor and some of the things we were going through. I didn't get the four spiritual laws out to him or the Romans road, but I just made a connection with somebody to say, hey, we're all kind of in this together. And I don't know where he stands. I've talked with him before. So it's just... Take the opportunity to serve. Take the opportunity to serve. Um, God said Saul was his chosen instrument. You are God's chosen instrument for something. 
You need to find out what it is. I have believed a lot of the ministry that I've experienced has been for people who are leaving a church that doesn't teach the Bible to come to a Bible church. That happens to be my testimony. As I grew, I realized this church is not cutting it. And so people leaving that kind of church to come and be grounded in the Word of God. That, that, I don't say that's the only ministry. I've had ministry in, in uh, uh, rescue mission down in Harrisburg. I've had ministry with the handicapped. I've had all kinds of ministries. But you just keep moving to what the next thing is God wants you to do and know that you have a purpose. God has a purpose for you in that. But next verse 16, the first part says, For I will show Paul... This is Jesus talking to Ananias. I will show Paul how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. We need grace for salvation, grace for service, and we need grace for suffering. We need grace for suffering. You need to get a hold of a theology of suffering so that when things happen to you, you have that foundation to say, Lord, I'm trusting in you. I'll admit there are times I think, Lord, I think I've suffered enough. And yet when I look back and see the suffering of others, who have I to say I've suffered enough? Why are things so hard? I told Deborah Isaacs uh, when she called me about her daughter with her broken leg and her battle against cancer and all the things that are going on, I said, do not believe the lie of Satan that, that you're under attack because something's wrong with you. That is a lie from the pit of hell. In fact, it might be the fact that you're serving the Lord that makes you under this attack. And, and we just need to, to recognize that. We have to have grace for suffering. We have to have a doctrine of suffering. Johnny Erickson talks about this all the time. So many ministries want to get her healed. She knows that's not God's plan for her. Not that she doesn't have enough faith, and that's what sometimes they suggest. Beware those health and wealth ministries. If you have more faith, you'll have more money, you'll have more health. I'm sorry to tell you that's not the case. Not that God doesn't heal, not that God doesn't bless people. Uh, as they handle their finances well. But don't believe that it's for everyone to have so much and be so healthy. We need to recognize that. So grace for salvation, grace for service, grace for suffering, and then grace for relationships. John 15, the passage that Leah read, ends with the command to love one another. If you're going to bear fruit, one of the key parts of that fruit is to love one another. You're going to love one another. That's a command, the greatest commandment, to love God and love one another. With believers, look at verse uh, 19b. For some say he was, no, I'm, I'm sorry, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. This is after Saul got saved. He took some time to fellowship. When you get saved, you shouldn't just walk off and say, I'm going to live my life for God. You need to have fellowship. So with believers, we need grace for a relationship with believers because believers aren't perfect. And sometimes it's hard for believers to get along. So we need God's grace. Then in verse 20, it says, And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. Now that's a pretty big turnaround from wanting to kill anybody who believed that to now proclaiming it in the synagogues. But we are always going to have a relationship with unbelievers. And you need to ask God for the grace to know when to speak up, what to say, and how to say it. Again, don't get stuck into, I've got to get the four spiritual laws. I have to get the Romans road. I have to just befriend people. And as God opens up the doors, pray that you're spiritually discerning enough to walk through those doors and share with unbelievers the grace that has impacted you. You know, here, we'll see. Saul was like, I, 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 I'll just say it, Ravi Zacharias. Have you ever heard of Ravi Zacharias? He had a way to just turn everything to make you challenge what you were thinking when it wasn't true. He, he helped point you to truth. Well, Saul, in his background of studying to be a Pharisee, he knew, the, he knew the, the Old Testament like the back of his hand. And when he finally got saved, it was like a switch went off, and all of those things opened up for how they pre went, how they pointed to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He did this immediately, but there's something else that he did, and it's not found in Acts 9. Galatians 1, you can look there and just listen as I read. I'm just going to read the last half of verse 16 through verse 19 of Galatians 1. I did not immediately consult with anyone, nor did I go up to Jerusalem 
to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas, that's Peter, and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Paul is writing to the Galatians about the fact that you don't have to become a Jew to become a Christian. And in this part of the argument, he's explained to him that he didn't get the gospel from other people. He was an apostle because he got the gospel directly from Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. And for a three-year period, when he was ministering around Damascus, it says he was in Arabia, and that's, they're not too far away. So was he there all the time? Did he go back and forth? We don't quite know. And we don't know if he was out there all three years, but he spent some time alone. Some people think getting ready for the outline to write Romans when he had a chance to write it later. That he got all of his uh, theology, just he and the Lord. Remember whenever we have communion, we'll have communion next week, Lord willing. Lord willing. I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. There were times that Paul had such a deep relationship with the Lord that God just spoke to him. You don't always need to hear a message, get something online. You need to open up the Word of God and let him speak to you. We need the grace to see that we need believers, we need to have a relationship with unbelievers, but we need to develop our relationship with God. If we're going to move forward in the post-COVID-19 ministry, we need to be hearing the voice of the Lord. And that's not just for the pastor or the elders, trustees, or deacons. That's for all of us. And if you have something you feel like the Lord is telling you, then you bring it, and let's talk about it. When we have a couple of town hall meetings and trainings with, with Peter, come. Come and enjoy the, the fellowship and the conversation and see what the Lord brings to Bethel Memorial Baptist Church. I would have no hope because we can't compete with the big churches. But I actually think the big churches are hurting more than we are right now because they're so built on big crowds, and they can't do that. So praise the Lord. <laughs> My wife and I were talking about if the rapture should come, how long will they leave all of these uh, YouTube services on, on the Internet? How long will they be there? And I said, well, you know what? We're such a small little part of that. They'll probably take the big ones off first. So we really might have a ministry after we all go to heaven. I don't know. I don't know. Just the, the fact is, God has a ministry for us, and we need to see that. So I hope you see it's always going to be about his grace. The foundation of our salvation, we should never forget that. It's never something we should, oh, I don't need to hear that again. We need to hear it. Salvation, service, the call to get involved. Youth group, sound, sound room, technical all the things that we, you'll be hearing about these ministries. And the other thing, don't assume because there's somebody there that you're not needed. We're going to see next week, Paul rarely, if there's only one time I can think, where he traveled alone. There was always somebody alongside of him. So we could double the people helping with any ministry we have and have people being trained up and ready to go. So, so just don't think, well, they don't really need me. Yes. The Lord has a plan for you. Find out what it is. The grace for service, the grace for suffering. It's so great when you're serving and you're and ministering to people. I've heard this from the praise team. Their prayer time before they practice, they are a small group and they, they, they minister to one another. They pray for one another. It makes a difference. And boy, they've been through some things. And just to, to recognize that. And of course, the grace for relationships. We're part of this world. Even if you're an introvert, you need to relate to people. Relate to people, believers, non-believers, and to God. Okay, the second thing that I want us to remember, and this is kind of where this whole thought was going originally in my mind, we need to remember our need to grow. I actually had the word adapt there at first, uh, to adapt. Growth means adapting. You're changing if you're growing. If you say, well, I'm saved, and I served in a Sunday school class 30 years ago, and, and I'm, I, I, you know, I, I've been through my suffering, and, and you know, I, I know the people that I know. God's calling you to grow beyond where you are right now. 
however long you've served the Lord, however long you've walked with him, he is calling you to grow beyond what it is that you know of him. We need to grow in grace. We need to grow in grace. Acts 9, 22, it says, Paul, but Saul increased all the more in strength. As much as he knew, he never stopped growing. And I believe that phrase would suggest the time in Arabia where he really became solid in what he believed. It's what uh, mi missionaries do and pastors do that go off and study the Word of God. I've, I've recently talked about a young man who wrote a book and became the darling of all youth ministry because of the book that he wrote. He hadn't really been trained. Now he's forsaken his faith and, and just has left it. That foundation needs to be there. We need to always be growing in grace. It's the foundation of what God does, not what we do. No matter what, how many copies of a book you can sell and how many people are telling you, you're really awesome. We need to grow in grace with God and our salvation. Um, the last part of verse 22. And he confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by praying that Jesus, by proving, I'm sorry, that Jesus was the Christ. By proving that this that sounds like Ravi Zacharias again. That ability to speak in such, to, to always have the right verse. To, oh, you don't have to do that to, to be growing in sharing God's grace. Just tell people your story. Tell people how God has ministered grace to you. I, I you know, I, I, I joked before I decided to preach Ephesians I said, I, maybe it's time for me to finally pr preach Romans. It's something I want to do. And I actually thought the rapture might come before we get done with it, but I, I'm not going to predict anything. Uh, but, but, but sharing God's grace, you just need to tell your story. One of the outlines for Ephesians is God's story, the, the gospel story, and then the second half is your story. So just, you just don't have to be the perfect apologist but you need to tell people about God's grace in your life. And you need to grow in perseverance. Have you counted the cost of following Christ? Remember, go back to the Gospels. It seemed like Jesus was trying to talk people out of following him. He read, are you sure you're ready? Are you sure you're ready? And too many times the churches today are all about just, let's get people to come sit in our church. And, and we've done something. The cost of discipleship. The cost. We have to persevere. And, and I want you to just, these were some of the things that led me back to this. How did Paul underdo? In his first missionary journey, three different cities in a row, he was driven out of Antioch, Pisidia, not the Antioch where he was sent from, but this in a different area, Pisidia. I didn't put any maps up this week. He was driven out of there. So he went to Iconium, the city that was close. They made trouble there, and he heard that they were planning to stone him. So he left the Iconium, and then in Lystra, he was actually stoned and left for dead outside the city. The grace in perseverance. Paul got up. They went out to check on him. He got up. He went into the city, spent one more night, and went on. Now, I think if that were my first missionary uh, year, this is Beth, consider this. If your first missionary looks this bad, maybe you should consider, you know, I, I'm praying so much for Sarah Thielman right now because she's been serving the Lord and her, her, her future is just way up in the air right now. The plans are all being adjusted constantly. But, but Paul, hey, let's do this again. And in the second missionary journey, he was beaten to Philippi. There was a riot in Thessalonica. We talked about that the last, in that series. And then he was threatened by death in Berea and they escorted him out at night to go to Athens. So Paul had the grace to persevere. Now, I don't have that grace. You're not, not supposed to have it right now. You're supposed to grow in it. And as you grow in it, when things happen, God will be ready. You'll be ready. You have to trust that. So remember our need to grow, to adapt. And then finally, grow in relationships. <coughs> Verse 25. But his disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening. I'm sorry, I think I skipped one. No, I didn't read that verse. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. 
This is when he was back in Damascus. He was back in Damascus, and the Jews plotted to kill him. But the disciples took him by night and let him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. The thing I noted there was his disciples. In his ministry, he collected people. He didn't just plant a church and move on. He developed relationships. As I was studying through this, I was reminded, I, I knew I knew it, but I'd forgotten it. He never visited Colossae, but he knew Epaphras and Onesimus. So because he knew them, he decided to write that church. He was always connecting with people. You're going to hear next week about Aquila and Priscilla, Timothy and Silas, Barnabas. But Paul had those relationships. As Beth is here, she's here to see if she can uh, get support, not just financially, but in prayer, that people will be praying for her ministry. Sarah has been doing the same thing. Any missionary does that. Paul collected people all the time. And, and Apollos was a big part of, of ministry when he kind of was in Ephesus and then said, I'll be back. And then there's just, we'll talk about that next week. Grow in your relationships. Remember our need to grow, to grow. And just change the word adapt. If you think, no, oh, I like it the way it is, you're fighting an uphill battle. Life has not stayed the way it is in 2020. So now we've been forced to do a lot of things. We thought well, maybe we'll get to that someday. We're here, and we need to, to do that together. My conclusion is simply this. Paul's ministry reminds us to abide in Christ and his grace. The more you study Paul, the more you know grace. And the message of grace is so clear in the first couple of chapters of Ephesus. It's the gospel story. My, my salvation verse, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works that he has prepared in advance for us. Those, that's all about grace. So we need to remember his grace, and we need to remember to grow and adapt to life according to his grace. Jesus is our only hope for forgiveness. There are times when you do something really awful, and you're going to make up for it by doing something good. That is not God's equation. It's sin plus the blood is forgiveness. We need to see that. It is only th we're only forgiven through, through our hope in Jesus Christ. Grace not only brings forgiveness, it also, the, one of the hymns, one of the verses of the hymn said this, uh, gives us the power to say no. It empowers us to live the life that we're to live. And then when we fail, it provides the, the loving forgiveness that God has for us. Jesus calls us to service. Great. God wants to overflow your life with so much grace you can't help but share it with other people. That you need to be involved in sharing the grace that overflows in your life with other people. Jesus understands suffering. We know what Paul wrote, I believe, in Corinthians. Talking about his thorn in the flesh. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Jesus suffered. He understands suffering and will give us the grace that we need. And then Jesus makes us a family. Grace is the basis of all solid relationships. I have to ask you, do you know Jesus as your Savior? That's the first relationship. It's not the first one you've experienced, but it's the most important one. All other relationships are going to grow out of the fact that you recognize you're a sinner, and apart from God's grace, you have no hope. But with God's grace, you can be forgiven, and you can then offer forgiveness to others, to those people that hurt you when you were young. You can let go of that bitterness. You can go beyond that. Do you know him? Are you serving him? Think of all the people that served Christ so that you would hear the message. Respond to his call and serve so that others can hear the message. Are you trusting in him? <sighs> Doing all kinds of things recently financially. Before COVID hit, I, I met with a new financial counselor and said, well, I'm looking at how old I am, looking at how much I need to try to save between now and retirement. I need to look at my plan for paying off the house is not a good plan at all. And I just recently refinanced. And 
And I go a little nuts with this stuff. I need to be trusting him through it all. I need to be trusting in him through it all. And then, are we living as a brother and sister in God's family? Jesus makes us family. To all who received him, to them who believed on his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. I hope you're encouraged by this today. I hope you can see our need to remember God's grace in every aspect of our lives. In all our ways, acknowledge him and his grace. And that we remember our need to grow. I'm just hanging on by the skin of my teeth. No. God wants you to overflow with joy. And you can conquer these things. And if you're not conquering, don't say, well, what's wrong with me? Just keep asking God, help me to find your joy. Help me to know your grace. Help me to grow in you. Those are the challenges we have this morning. Um, thankfully, a, a tornado didn't touch down as far as I've heard. It's a scary moment when we were thinking about it. And there's a hurricane coming up the coast. Don't know all that is going to happen there. God does. God knows when COVID-19 will be dealt with. If it will be dealt with, he knows. He's not asking you to worry about that. He's saying, walk with me right now and see the grace that I have for you grow in my grace. Father, I thank you for your care, for your love. I pray that we would indeed be encouraged, indeed be encouraged by looking at the life of Saul, who became Paul, who did so many things. We thank you for the, the ministry he had in Ephesus and all the things that led to his ministry to Ephesus that led to him to write such an awesome book of encouragement for the church. I pray that you would help us in the days ahead to just learn more about you, to grow in grace, to always know that we need to follow you. I thank you, Father. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.